everyone. Welcome to the poetry vlog. Today we have a special guest all the way out from the East Coast. Alonzo, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, thank you, Chelsea. Uh, so my name is Alonso Yerena. Uh, I'm a poet, a teacher. Uh, I was born in Lima, Peru. I traveled to the U.S. with my mother and my brother when I was 11 years old in 1997. Um, I have been living here in the East Coast since then. Um, I have taught in charter schools in the District of Columbia for about eight years or so. And I've recently started writing poetry in a more very serious manner to get published and to consider becoming, I don't know, I don't recognized. know. Recognized. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's in no shame. I, in, in part because what I, what I, what I write about, I think needs to be out there. Yeah. And because I really enjoy it. And it's that sensation of your poems actually reaching people. It's, yeah. I don't know how to describe it. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. I feel like poems are like another way of initiating a conversation, um, but you kind of get to have it on your own terms a little bit while also negotiating like potential readership. So it's not like a direct response, direct like saying to be responded to. It's like a more open-ended like dialogue almost. So I get it, I know. Um, why don't you contextualize for our listeners what you've been writing about and what feels urgent to you about the poems that you're reading and writing right now? The poetry I write, it's mostly about Peru, but at the same time, my experience. So Peru underwent a internal armed conflict between 1980 and 2000. Um, I left during that conflict. Uh, my family was lucky in being middle class by the time the conflict was happening around 95 or so. So we were not as affected as the rest of the country was, but we still would see it. It was still part of our lives. And we were even more lucky in that we were able to leave. Um, Can you offer some like historical context for listeners who might not be familiar? Like what was the armed conflict around? Um, what do you mean about still having it like visible in your lives and kind of being witness to it, that sort of stuff? So to make a long, long story short, um, the Peruvian government was at war with several terrorist groups. The two main ones were Shining Path and the revolutionary Tupac Amaru movement. Um, it was, they were socialist slash communist movements that wanted to overthrow the government through force. Um, and I grew up learning about this conflict and after, as it was happening and after it happened about a period of terrorism in Peru. And only in the last 10 years or so, I started learning more about it being an internal armed conflict and an actual war because uh, atrocities were committed on both sides. Yeah. And still to this day, the political repercussions of that conflict affect Peru. Um, the president at the time during the conflict, um, he did the first ever self-coup that Todd, he overthrew his own government and established different parameters for him to rule under so that he could supposedly fight the, uh, the subversives. But what happened was he became a dictator and many civil rights and human rights were violated over this long period of time. And in order to preserve those stories in the English language, um, I started writing these poems about them. Okay. Uh, different books that have come out from that period of time, mostly in Spanish. And there are some others in English. And there's a um, CVR, which is the uh, the complete research of the atrocities and the incidents of the war that were collected uh, and put together by the Peruvian government in 2003. They were translated by uh, the University of Notre Dame. And the latest one, the latest translation, I think, is from 2010, if I'm not incorrect. Okay. But... Okay. Um, there's really no poetry that touches on this subject in, in English. Yeah. And, and there's a Peruvian tradition of writing about conflict and war yeah. through poetry. And it goes back to, I'm not if you're familiar with Cesar Vallejo. Um, I don't think I am. He's one of the most prominent Latin American poets. And he wrote a book called um, Spain, Take This Chalice From Me. And it's a collection of poems about the Spanish Civil War. Okay. And, and uh, during the uh, early 80s when the conflict started, uh, a lot of young poets in Peru started writing poetry about 
the conflict as it started, as it was happening. Yeah. And um, that's the book that I mentioned to you. Is it's this this book is a study of six different poets and their poems about the Civil War as it was happening. So I guess my work is kind of um yeah my work is kind of like a retrospect, as if like yeah, now that yeah. it's over, yeah, um, sort of reconciliate in a way. And also kind of like a diaspora or diasporic kind of approach to it as well. Right? Exactly, yeah, yeah, because a lot of my poetry is also about immigration, exile, yeah. ha- having to have left. Yeah. And it's allowed me to connect with many different authors. So yeah, yeah. There, there's, no, there's no specific like proving authors that left that I can read yeah. outside of a few. But there's other great poets that I read and that help that yeah. sort of helped me shape my writing as well. Yeah. And actually, so two questions. First, for the podcast version of this, can you say the title of the book? I had it show for the YouTube watchers, but the book you mm-hmm. just referenced. Uh, the book is Poesía y Guerra Interna en el Perú, 1980 to 1992, mm-hmm. a study of poets and civil war in Peru. Perfect. Uh, and you were telling me before we started how like you couldn't get this book for less than like $500 in the States. So you had to have yeah. like a cousin who got it for you for 20 bucks in Peru and sent it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a, it's an academic book. It's very limited printing. So when I was yeah. searching for it for, for research and to help me write, um, I couldn't find it. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah I had sorry, a, my I had inner a, book nerd is like, that's so cool that you got it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and, uh, my cousin in Peru, I told him if, you know, he's like, Hey, this book, I just can't find it for a decent price. Yeah. You know, it yeah. cost me. And he said, I'll go check. And he found it. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And then you were saying that you find yourself in conversation with all these different poets. What are some of the poets that you've brought to read from for us today? Um, uh, I found myself in conversation with, uh, Javier Zamora. Okay. And- yep with um, Salma Sharif. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically, Javier Zamora just wrote an article for the New York Times this past Sunday. And it talks, the article talks about, the article is titled, I believe, um, Am I Welcome Here? And yeah. it talks about how he's finally, his paperwork went through and now he's in the U.S. Um, with permanent residency. Yeah. But yeah. he wonders if he's truly welcome here. And some of the poetry that I've, really enjoy from Salma Sharif talks about being from somewhere but really not feeling from there which is something that I experienced when I went to Peru this past spring it had been about 15 years since I traveled back to Peru yeah. and growing up here in the states I always had this strong 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 sensation from my from the atmosphere and social life that I, that I wasn't that was an, that was an outsider that that yeah. it, that was always over my head and for a long time I really thought that assimilation was the uh, the cure to this and uh, yeah. it was really it was really hard finding out that it's that's not the case yeah and yeah. so part of me became really enamored with home and with that sensation of that's where that's where I'm from yeah um, and having returned this past uh, this past spring I I realized that a lot of people don't see me as approving right and it was really really hard yeah it's like that that constant sense of displacement that you keep being promised will be alleviated through various cultural markers but then it never ends up being fully alleviated um, would you mind reading some of the pieces that you brought today that have kind of inspired your thinking on this, that you feel connected through with that? Yeah, of course. On my return to Peru, I listened to the poetry podcast. I listened to... <laughs> we were also talking about that before for listener and viewers context, because um, I actually yeah. have a similar practice. Like I play like the poetry VS or commonplace in the morning when I'm showering for the most part. Though lately I've been switching over to pop radio because I just can't take it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I listen. I listen to the uh, the weekly reading as I'm getting ready for the day, or if I'm yeah, taking yeah. a shower. And um, when I was in Peru, the first day I was in Peru, I uh, I didn't want to change that habit. Yeah. And I just wanted to take a shower and played the episode. And the episode started by saying, "This is uh, Salma Sharif reading the end of Exile." Yeah. And I found it so poignant that uh, that was the title of the poem for my first day back in Peru. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And I'm gonna read it for you. Perfect, thank you. The End of Exile As the dead, so I come to the city I am of and without to watch play out around me as theater audience as the dead are audience 
to the life that is not mine, is as not, as never. Turning down Shiraz's streets, it turns to be such a faraway thing, a without which I have learned to be. From bed, I hear a man in the alley selling something, no longer by mule and holler, but by bullhorn and jalopy. How to say what he is selling? It is no thing this language thought worth naming, no thing I have used before. It is his life I don't see daily, not theater, not play, though I remain on the audience. It is a thing he must sell daily, and every day he peddles this thing, a without which I cannot name, without which is my life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, would you mind talking a little bit about what about that poem like moves you, how it felt, you know, apropos for the moment? Um, yeah, what kind of keeps you returning to it? The line breaks in it are are perfect. I don't. I hope that I did a good job reading it. <laughs> but you did a great job reading it. By the way, I, I, yeah. I feel I've I feel that there's the sense of this location as the lines break. And then as the new one starts. Yeah, give us an just, example. Uh, of course, it is his life I don't see daily. Not theater, not play. Um, and then there's a thing he must sell daily. And every day he peddles this thing uh, without which I cannot name. So there's this sense of dislocation as you're reading it and as you're listening, mm -hmm. that really evokes a sensation of that, that the poet is trying to convey to the reader here. Um, something that really struck me as well, that really connected with me is, it is no thing this language thought worth naming. Um, it makes me think about the many, many, many words from the Spanish language that have no direct translation in English. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that it's framed to not just as like a, forgetting or as like a um, slippage it's very much called out for what it is which is it's not deemed worthy of like a word for it yeah. so in some ways then the feeling itself or the experience of it ends up going disavowed in a way that sort of says like you know this dominant language culture doesn't take the time to create a language around it or to like kind of enact a language around it and to give the readers more context she's talking about being back in Shiraz mm -hmm. and this is in, in Iran where she, she was born in Turkey and then moved to the U.S., yeah. but her family is from Iran. So this is her being there, and it's the sense of this, this dislocation from the place. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then and following that line, it is this language thought worth naming, followed by nothing I have used before. So she brings herself into it saying, like, I'm part of this, this, this disconnect. Yeah. And like I'm connected to that English language that didn't think this is worth naming, and I haven't used it before. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty brilliant because it so well uses that blank space that poetry offers that a lot of other genres don't allow for as much. Like sometimes when I'm reading, like, um, and this is, of course, so many fiction people will argue with me about this, but I feel <laughs> when I'm reading fiction that while there's much left to interpretation, obviously, the way that the words function on the page sort of fill it up. You know, yeah. you, don't, you don't have that same like extra like tool of the line break or the refusal to use a line break as an intentional maneuver. Um, obviously there's lots of hybrid genre work and there's a lot of fiction that pushes against this sort of generic limitation, but there's something about um, activist poetry, especially or poetry that's meant to call out or name like cultural harm where that line break can be used to create the emotion or kind of evoke it without necessarily needing to use the exact right word for it. So there's a way that she's like creating a language for it through the very like line breaks themselves while also like calling out the problem that she has to rely on the line breaks to do that work. Yeah. It's, it's really wonderful what she's done here. Um, and it, you know, I'll tell you exactly what happened as, as I was back in Peru for the first time in 15 years yeah. listening to this. I started crying in the shower when I heard yeah. this. It's uh, because as I was listening to this, there was a window there in the shower and I could see the Lima skyline that I hadn't seen in 15 years and how different it was. And 
I, uh, a funny thing, it was just a very strange and funny day being back. Yeah, yeah. And I say funny because I even felt more connected to this poem when I was, I was in a, I was in an Uber. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a very American thing, right? To, to just yeah, take an Uber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I called an Uber, you know, it's like, it's like I was back at home two days ago. I'm yeah. calling an Uber. So I call the Uber and I get in the Uber and I have this poem in the back of my head and I'm trying to feel and I'm like, okay, so like, I'm not this, I'm not that disconnected from my yeah. home country. Yeah. Uh, I, and I start talking about what's going on in Peru with the driver and it's going fantastic. And as, and as the driver's dropping me off, the driver is asking, ask, ask me, where are you from? Uh, yeah. And start crying again. <laughs> I would. <laughs> no shame. <laughs> I I contained myself and I, and and I really wanted to hear out this person, right? Yeah. And he could not. He he started trying to guess where I was from, and he he said, "You sound like you're maybe from Costa Rica." And and then I said, "No, I'm I'm Peruvian." And it's and then. Uh, I realized in, you know, and it, 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 it all came back to me, right? Yeah. One of the things I try to do when I was younger is I fought so hard to lose my accent. And I didn't realize that mm -hmm. in, in trying to lose my accent, I lost my own. Yeah. So. There was a was... quote in um, an essay. Do you know the poet Banu Kapil? I'm no. like kind of obsessed with her, but there was a, an essay that wasn't really a real essay. It was like a poetic intervention essay. Um, and it was talking about how, I'm trying to remember the exact phrase, but it was basically like the unlearning of an accent. So the sound of like a gone accent, because like just, you know, not like losing a, one particular accent is another type of accent, right? Mm -hmm. Is the sound of a language dying in the mouth. Um, and it's, and it's critiquing that as this like colonial, like people talk about like, Oh, just learn like the language where you're at and deal. And it's like, no language is a whole like meaning making system that is totally embodied, you know, like language is a, like to speak is a very physical act. I don't know how that gets forgotten to be totally honest. I'm not, I'm not sympathetic to it being forgotten. Yeah, yeah. It's very I, physical and to lose that, like, yeah. Uh, that makes me think a lot about, um, Lee Young Lee. Are you familiar with, with yeah, him? Yeah. Yeah. Familiar, but not like, you know, in-depth knowledge. Huh? Um, because there's one, there's one thing that he says about poetry and uh, reading poetry. You know, to think that when you're writing and reading poetry, it's that uh, there's this whole process, right, of words going out and words coming in. But when words come out, you know, there's that little bit of life that leaves because you're exhaling. So there's oh, dying. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's dying in every word as it leaves you. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I read a poem. Um by Christos, who was this, like, is, is living, but was published in This Bridge Called My Back, which is just kind of like a seminal anthology book, radical writings by women of color. Um, I shouldn't say that, like, it's a banal, but it's just, like, kind of one of the intro to intersectional women's studies and gender studies and sexuality studies texts. And Christos is also an indigenous queer poet, and they have this poem um, I'm trying to remember the title of it. I read it for the for the flash briefing. Ceremony for completing a poetry reading, and it's about how this sort of exhalation of the language and like giving the poem as a physical act is kind of like offering like a banquet um, or kind of giving so much of yourself until there's almost nothing left, you know. And I'm like, oh, it's you know, it's beautiful. It's romantic. Um, it's a generous way for us to be thinking about our work when we put it out in the world. And then I felt kind of like, I was thinking more about it in the context of which it's written. And I'm like, it's only made that way for some folks, right? There's the folks that get to like, you know, write about the tree as if there's nothing about the tree that's political. <laughs> and for them, like, it could be argued that maybe that's not exactly like a complete giving over in the same way that really writing about the things that evoke like both pain, joy, and hope because of a very historically situated and lived experience does, you know, um, and actually I'd be curious about that too. So like for you, when you write on these topics, how does that leave you feeling? You know what I mean? Like, I know for me, like I used to write on Lyme disease a lot, um, and queerness a lot, and I can still write about queerness a lot and not feel emptied. Um, I can't write a lot about Lyme disease without feeling emptied. Like I, I feel like I've given something away to someone I don't want to give. It's like something I've been struggling with. You know what I mean? 
So I'm curious about this like moment right now in our po- poetic landscape, <laughs> you know, where <laughs> poetry is finally figuring out that you need to attend to this giving that's being done yeah. and receive it well. But I'm like, but what about how it feels? You so know? it depends on, you know, sometimes the po- the poems themselves have this intended uh, message that I want to send with them. But yeah. th- there's always that second uh, subject that appears either at the end or halfway yeah. through the poem. It's when I feel that a poem is really coming alive when suddenly the poem is going on its own and, whoa, the, yeah. the, the poem is taking you to its end. Which is like the best poetry lesson for anyone listening in who's like, I don't write poems what I want to. Like, let the poem do that. Like, don't feel betrayed by it. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's let the poem have its own agency until you finish it. Yes. Then you can, then you can edit it if you want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Read, read for us one of your poems, actually, if you don't mind giving that generously. Would you mind reading one of your poems for us to, and then talking through what second subject came, like what was your intended subject? What was the second subject that came out? And how did it feel when you kind of wrapped it up? You know what I mean? The question is, it's great because writing poetry sometimes can take a lot out of you. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it can also fulfill you and make you feel cathartic as to whatever the poem might have been about. For example, I I started one I started writing a poem about a hike in Cusco, and it became about my best friend that passed away seven mm-hmm. years ago. Um, so that can happen a lot when you're writing poetry. Um, so I'm gonna read a poem to you. It's called Bajada Balta. Um, Bajada Balta is this is this little it's a small road that's all rocky that's about three blocks from where I used to live in Peru, right by the coast in Lima. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Bajada Balta. Worn dock, my feet, on the same beach rocks, an old newspaper which my dirty hands bought, flew through fish scented wind. I could see the ocean from my balcony as a child, where two twin bridges now lie. Above bright ocean reflected light, two paths, two motives. I crossed them and felt age old fog embrace me from two directions. As the same different birds chirped over my morning walk searching for the part of me who could not believe I nearly forgot their song. They did not see the war as the streets across those always visible from my old pink fourth floor. I, I love that poem. Um, would you mind, I, I'm going to do the annoying question that nobody wants people to ask. Can you talk a little bit about what you went in thinking and what you left thinking and feeling? Um, so I, I actually misread the poem. There's a line here that I, I always do that sometimes. when I, I misread poems all the time. <laughs> horrible <laughs> yeah i've never i've never done it to my own poem so <laughs> okay now yeah. I feel like yeah. um okay so this poem is about bajada balta which is a very specific place uh in lima peru and miraflores where i used to live for the last yeah. few years while i lived there uh, i actually had to walk through this through this road on the way to school in peru and i was there this past spring and I would walk it all the time with one of my sisters to go get lunch or to go get breakfast with her. And while I was walking through it, um, I heard these blackbirds chirping and I, and at first I was like, Whoa. And my sisters are looking at me like I'm, I'm, I'm crazy. And, and they're asking me what? And I was like, it's the bird. And it's like, yeah, the bird, what the bird. <laughs> it's also the name of my cat's toy, sidebar. It's literally called, like, the bird. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> go ahead. It's, I tell them, you don't hear this bird. I, don't, I, I haven't heard this bird in 15 years. Mm-hmm. And they're thinking, you're crazy. What do you mean you haven't? It's like, they don't have this kind of bird in North America. So at first I didn't recognize the bird. And yeah. then... It like it it hit me. It really hit me. So I wanted to write a poem about this little stretch of of road and street and what it feels to have been there when I was a kid and that conversation that I was having with myself. How could you nearly forget what the 
what the birds sounded like, what these, these blackbirds, to be right. more specific. Yeah. What they sounded like. And it, it, it also plays with that sense of dislocation from the place, not being back in Peru, and trying to connect to it. It was like, wait a minute, I don't know the birds, but I do recognize them. That's, that's, yep. I recognize them because I don't know them almost, right? Yeah, so that, yeah. So that I guess that's why the line goes, as the same different blackbirds chirp. Mm-hmm. Um, but, as the song, but as the poem is getting to the end, um, and I say, believe that I nearly forgot their song, immediately the poem jumped to the war. Um, they did yeah. not see the war as the streets across. Because on the other side of uh, the district, maybe three, four blocks, there was a huge terrorist attack in 1992, um, which is actually, I can see that street from the fourth floor that I lived in. Because yeah. I, I used to live in an apartment. So if to kind of like put it into perspective in the minds of the listeners. So I would live here in the center. And then off to the right is where Bajada Balta would be. Yeah. And then off to the left is Larco Street. And then that's where the terrorist attack happened in 92. Yeah. So, um, so it swerved on you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. So it became about that. And then also always visible for my old pink fourth floor. And I remember being a kid going to the balcony in the fourth floor and then looking at the ocean on the left and then on the right, looking at these streets. Um, yeah. There's also like, I mean, a micro commentary cause I know we're approaching 30 minutes already. Um, I know it goes really fast, but there's yeah. like the staccato. So the, um, but where it's just pink fourth floor. You know, and the rest of the poem, it had sort of longer, drawn-out rhythmic qualities. Like, there were a lot of, like, unstressed syllables, essentially. Yeah. And then we get to that end, and it's, like, in the pink fourth floor. And it's almost like we're, we're suddenly very much emplaced with you, if that makes sense. Like, it really locates itself. Um, and it's striking, because you're like, wait a second, pink? <laughs> Um, which is one of those things where it's like an idiosyncratic detail that completely like swerves the attention in the poem as well for the listener and viewer. Um, and it, yeah, I, I really appreciated that ending. That was spot on. Um, awesome. All right. We have to wrap up okay. soon or I'm going to like disappoint for the millionth time. The folks that watch that asked me to make these shorter. What have we not gotten to today that you're like, Chelsea, I really want to talk about this one thing. I didn't get to say it. Some of the authors in, in this book. Okay. Yeah. Um, this, this poem, I'm trying to still work with, work with it so that I can put it in a chapbook that I've been working on for some cool. months. Yeah. And, um, the image of fog and this pink is found in other poems. So it kind of connects to them. Okay. Um, but you, I read this out of your question. Uh, what, how does it make you feel? So there are other poems that I have written that are really in depth about specific incidents during the war. And there's one in particular that I wrote about a, um, a, a block party, uh, a small party being infiltrated by these um, government uh, of, um, agents of the Peruvian Secret Service. And they massacred everyone at the party because they were suspected of being terrorists. And it's, um, it's a poem that starts very happy and it has all these images of, at a, of a party and then it just jumps into really gory imagery. And yeah. I actually, I actually cried when I finished writing the poem, and it really takes a lot of you sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the poet that I wanted to talk to you about from this from this book is his name is uh, Jose Antonio Masotti. He he wrote a few poems about the war as it was happening, and there's a specific poem that he wrote about a a prison riot that was put down by the government and almost everyone was judiciously executed at the prison. And it starts with, um, the poem is the the title of the poem is the date of the incident. And before, and my poem also has as his title, the date of the incident. And he left Peru in 88 because of the conflict. And now he's a professor of us of Spanish literature at Tufts university. Okay. So his his book is called The Fox and the Moon, The Zorro y la Luna. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's a collection of his his poems and he has really influenced me as in, as to how to write about something that affected you but you weren't really there because yeah. a, a lot of journals these days they don't want to they want they don't want poetry uh, poetry about war 
unless yeah. you're a veteran or you've been there. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Because how genuine can it be, right? If you weren't really there, but at the same time, this was our bread and butter every day. And this, yeah. these happens. So and like it's it's generational, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and that's carried on, like carry quite literally carry that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, yeah. Would you, okay. Can we go out with you? Would you mind reading one poem? It doesn't have to be in English if they're only available in Spanish. We have some Spanish speaking listeners, so that's fine too. But I'm wondering if that would be like a really great way to exit today. Um, I'm really yeah. putting you on the spot for everyone else watching and listening. So if you're like, no, Chelsea, we're not doing that. That's totally cool. Um, so the title of this poem is 19 de junio, La muerte en los penales, 1986. Okay. June, June 19th, Death in the Prisons, 1986. Uh, it has an epigram. It's Forget Not by John Milton. Hmm. Fueron cuatro corolas incendiándose antes de que tocara la hora. La mañana anterior la noticia se había levantado bostezando. Arregló fugazmente la cama, hizo tres gárgaras, y con suave desgarbo entró sorpresiva en los oídos, como el bicho instalado, para siempre en el huerto, del blanco cementerio de pelícanos. Antes de la hora, antes de la hora, ni siquiera pudieron esperar. Todos vimos el cerro quemándose en la niebla. Tú nunca supiste lo que fue esa madrugada, y las horas siguientes cuando cientos de rostros, simulando alegría, se lanzaron, celebrando los sucesos y jurando para siempre haber terminado la guerra. Una guerra que nunca empezamos. Un solo corazón se desangraba debajo de la tierra, lejos, desde el sur. Llegaban sus raíces carcomiendo el viento. Desde entonces los sueños se han vuelto ladrillos y fierro. La música monota de un chorro, cayendo por el acantilado. Hasta el fondo de la cordillera se esparcía el eco. Los pájaros huían y tú nunca llegaste. Solo un grito perpetuo desquiciando. Mis manos. Un trotar de caballos. Convirtiendo en arena mis huesos y piel. Después, un enorme silencio que rompió la mañana y el mar se fue calmando. ¿Cómo pesa en el cerebro ese ladrillo, Julián, Félix, Jacinto? ¿Cómo pesan? Vimos correr los camiones con desmonte. Por las piedras sus dedos se asomaban, despidiéndose. El frío y el sueño, hermanados, la luna y el miedo conviviendo. Y cuando el sol cayó puntual sobre el océano, la sombra se introdujo en nuestras almas con una idea fija. Entonces se produjo lo temido. Antes... Antes todavía de la hora, mucho antes de que el mundo se durmiera, empezaron a sonar los cañonazos, cuatro veces primero, después hasta el borde del día, como olas, sin dejar un solo rasgo, de los nombres dibujados en la playa. El islote fue entonces desierto, y la entrada apestosa de Cumas se abrió como un hocico en el peñón. Del otro extremo hubo historias semejantes, y los prisioneros fueron puestos en fila y rematados, como hojas de un árbol, furioso, salido de pronto debajo de la tierra. Los vecinos oyeron los lejanos cantos, y un martillo perpetuo, desquiciando, mis manos, rebotando en las montañas, descendiendo al río turbulento que se esparce desde el sur. La guerra es la guerra, se explicaban. Otros, cautelosos, Apuntaban con la uña herida. Un solo corazón se revolvía hinchado. Un solo viento dejaba pasar entre sus huecos. Un ruido constante. Un ruido que adquiría contornos y sabor. Se arrastraba y coloreaba por la médula flotando eternamente entre los sueños. Cadáveres, 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 peldaños de brazos y piernas, de cinturas y ojos reventados. Los tambores cortando los vidrios y en el aire, un silencio complicado y torpe. Demasiado para una mañana, húmeda y tibia de invierno. Tú nunca llegaste, o quizás no supiste llegar. Desde el fondo de un río hablan por ti Jacinto y Félix. Van gimiendo, 
cada vez que me raspo con la arena, cuando miro mis huesos cubiertos de hongos, mi piel inflándose en el sol, en medio de alas y picos, regados desde abajo y en silencio. Thank you for doing that for us. And podcast listeners, if you're like, I want to see it, then go over to YouTube and you can check it out there. All right. We are almost double the time set out for, so we're going to wrap up. This was right. truly a pleasure. Thank you so much, Alonzo. Um, thank you so much. And I'll go ahead and say bye to everyone else on the vlog. So as always, everyone, feel free to go to the website, chelseagrima.com. Follow the links in the description below to Instagram or Facebook. Email me and, of course, subscribe, like, and comment to this video so I can hear what you all think. And thank you for joining on another Poetry Vlog episode. Alonzo, thanks again for making the time all the way from the East Coast. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>